Maybe they've gone five years without testing the alarms. That's a, that's a terrifying thought. All right. Well, at least we know it works. Okay. So, as I was saying before, uh, before the, the universe came crashing down, um, the music I was playing for is by a, uh, a jelly by the name of Balakoyate. Um, he lives currently in Massachusetts. He fronts a band called uh, World Vision. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why I wanted to play this particular uh, music for you. One, because he plays the balafon, which in the Malinke culture is the prestige instrument of the jelly. Right, this is the instrument that traditional jelly get most excited about playing, um, and that um, rulers try to get their hands on because it gives them a great deal of prestige. Right, so the balafon, does anyone remember what a balafon is? It's like a xylophone. Yeah, exactly, it's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wooden xylophone, essentially, right? And it takes a lot more skill and money to produce one than most other traditional instruments of West Africa. So, if you have a balafon, it indicates that you're a person of wealth, power, and influence. <laughs> Bless you. The other reason I wanted you to hear this particular piece of music is because it um, really does demonstrate um, the ways in which um, the jelly tradition is a living tradition, right? It's not just about preservation. Um, you may have heard in that music, right, the Balakoyate's band includes an electric guitar and a bass, in addition to, you know, three traditional drummers, uh, himself playing the balafon and a female vocalist, right? Third point about this is that um, both men and women can be jelly, right? It's not a gender-specific role, although Men and women do not perform the same kinds of songs, typically. There are certain songs that men are given to perform that women typically are not permitted to perform. Uh, so, in addition to the epic, the things you will typically hear a jelly sing are praise songs at public events. It's their primary ceremonial musical function. Right? Praise songs of either living people or of uh, famous ancestors. Epic, on the other hand, or um, in the Malinke language, Kumakuro, has traditionally been reserved for men. And not even all men who happen to be of the jelly class of that particular profession. Um, usually, each clan has what's called a, each, um, each clan of, of jelly, of griot, has a, uh, what's called a kumatigi. The kumatigi translates to master of the word. So these clans of barbs will usually have a chief bard, and the most important songs, the most important performances, are given to him to do. Uh, for example, you might remember um, I told you a little bit about that um, religious ceremony that takes place every seven years, right? At which the, the Sunjata epic is performed called Kamabalon. At Kamabalon, the Kumatigi of the Diabati clan. The Diabati are the royal bards. Will perform the Sunjata epic. 
Diabati and who? The Diabati clan. D-I-A-B-A-T-E. They're the, the royal bards of Mali. And as I think I said last time, we don't actually know anything about this performance in detail because you're not allowed to record it. So nobody really knows what this official version of the epic sounds like. But yeah, men and women can be bards, but women are largely limited to singing praise songs at public events. Only, actually, even most men are largely limited to praise songs at public events. Um, in order to be a singer of epic, you have to be a very important person in your bard tribe. All right, so that out of the way. Um, how did the second half of this go for you? Great. Great? Yeah. Wonderful? Lovely? Just swam right through it? What time period is this? What, what, you mean what time period is it describing? Okay, the time <laughs> period it's describing. Um, Sunjata Kaita, the historical figure, would have lived in, I think, the 13th century. It's 12th or 13th. Pretty sure it's 13th. Um, I'm a little bit fuzzy on exact dates, but then again, the story itself is fuzzy on exact dates. So why do you ask? Um, well, I was just wondering, and it sounded really old, and mm -hmm. it's just like, it's, I don't know, it just sounded like they wouldn't have guns back then. No, they wouldn't have. You're right. But in on page 1564, uh -huh. at the bottom, yeah. it was talking about how... Uh, they like would fire their muskets and all that. Yeah, talking about right the battle taking place in gun smoke, all that sort of thing, right? Yeah, um, and you're right. There, there would not have been firearms in West Africa in the 13th century. Um, the only people who would have had uh, firearms in the 13th century would have been the Chinese. Um, Since before the times, the Mongols conquered all of the Eurasia and brought gunpowder to the West. Yeah, basically. <laughs> But um, remember that the perform right. This is a, a recording of a relatively recent performance of the epic, right? So um, I think you know this is uh, you know this was t transcribed sometime in the 1990s, and the epic changes as time goes on, right? So once muskets are introduced into Africa, muskets start appearing in versions of the Sunjata story. Right? Do, does anybody remember, um, there's a reason for this, does anybody remember um, we talked about the West African idea of history last time? What does history look like? Oh, yeah, it's a dot on top of a dot on top of a dot on top of a dot, right? It's not, not so much a circle, it's not that things keep recurring, that's more the East Asian um, and South Asian view of history. But yeah, um, it's essentially that all history is simultaneous. The ancestors are always around, they're always with you. Um, they never really go away. Um, and so the fact that they didn't have muskets in the 13th century doesn't mean that the story can't include muskets now, right? Because now we do have muskets. The, st the same thing goes um, for Sunjata's religion, right? Sunjata Kaita would have lived before Islam was widely, uh, was widely practiced in West Africa, but the fact that he wasn't a Muslim then doesn't mean he can't be a Muslim now. Does everybody understand? Okay, but yeah, um, yeah. what you're noticing is that, yeah, that sort of view of history is everything occurring simultaneously. Yes, Vanna. So this is similar to 1001 because they added Islam, because the start of 1001 was prepared before Islam, right? Yeah, most of the stories in the Thousand and One Nights um, are compiled from a variety of different sources, almost all of which predate Islam or had nothing whatsoever to do with Islam anyway. Um, so yeah, um, Islam is added to those stories. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it's, it's worked into, it's pretty well integrated into the Sanjata epic as well. It's, it's more integrated into this version than you see in, other ver than you see in some other versions. Um, there are other versions of the Sunjata epic where um, Islam and sort of the older West African paganism um, sit much more uncomfortably beside each other. 
Um, and the further you go out, go out into rural areas, the more prominent those older pagan traditions will become. Right? The predominant religion in Mali today is Islam. Most, most people in Mali are Muslims. But a lot of them are like, we think of Islam as a monotheistic religion, right? Right, there is only one God, and that God um, essentially, you know, allows things to happen or doesn't allow things to happen. Not all Muslims actually subscribe to a completely monotheistic viewpoint, though. There's another point of view called henotheism. Has, that, has anybody ever heard this term before? Does this sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, Tanisha, do you know what he, what's henotheism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's pretty much exactly it. Um, a henotheist only worships one god, but acknowledges the existence or the possibility of the existence yeah. of others. Yeah. Sorry, I was like, wait. Blood? No, that's hemo. Hemo, yes. H-E-N-O, yep. Not hemo. That would be something very quite very different, yes. So Savannah. It, it allows them to be uh, like blood worship. Uh, more civilized, like as we would consider it, but it allows them to keep their like tribal gods and stuff like that, basically. Essentially, yeah, that they, they can yeah, like the fact that um, the fact that Ogun the you know, Ogun the Divine Smith doesn't exist, uh, the, the fact that I don't worship him doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Um yeah, yeah, there's um, a good example. Um, there were people who did research on belief in the fairies uh, in the British Isles in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And, uh, you know, there was a, a folklorist who went and talked to an old lady out in rural Ireland. And, you know, she said, well, you know, no, I don't believe in the fairies, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. And the fairies in European tradition are really just sort of toned down versions of old pagan gods. So that's sort of an, you know, an example of hemo, henotheism. He, now you've got me doing a hemotheism. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Damn it, Frank. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that's an example of henotheism in the West, yeah. But yeah, that, that, that's, that's sort of how, like, this, is, this version is much more Muslim than a lot of other versions are. And I think it's, you know, because it's um, being told by a bard with, uh, you know, official position um, in a more, who lives in a more urban setting. Yeah, secret. Would it be safe to assume that um, it is challenging the Muslim customs by making like the gender roles equal? Well, yeah, equal? Uh, can, um, I'm not sure I get what you're asking. Can you? Um, uh, okay, for um, right for both his wife, when she was cooking, uh -huh. yeah. and she kind of demanded something like, go find me a cooking pot. Uh -huh. You would see that in like Greek, um, Texas, or Asian, or any other Texas for that matter, this time, yeah. type of time period where a woman is telling a man. Yeah, like, and we... We still see a kind of division of labor here, right? There are things that men do and things that women do, but we don't really see... Um, women seem to have a much stronger role in this than we're used to in Epic, right? You know, we don't just, you know, a woman sitting and waiting at home or a woman sitting around waiting to be rescued or captured, right? Women play a much more active role in this and often get one over on the men. Yeah, Ty? Um, I had a question about what the Kilo, whatever his name was. Fuck, Facoli. Facoli. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, and what's going on with Fakoli and Sumawaro, right? Let's try to think back to what we said about kinship ties last time. How are Fakoli and Sumawaro related? Yeah, Sumawaro is Fakoli's nephew. Is Fakoli's uncle? And 
through which relative are they related? Yeah. Fakoli's mother is Sumawaro's sister. Yes. Um, and again, through since we're talking about a polygamous culture and these relationships get complicated, through which parent? Yeah, Sumawaro and Fakoli's mother have the same mother. Right? So you remember this distinction from last time between Badenya and Fadenya. Right? Mother child versus father child. How do these relationships work? What's the difference between being related via your mother and being related via your father? Being related by your mother means your allies, father is your rival. <laughs> yep, exactly. Good. So because Fakoli's mother and Sumawaro have the same mother, they should ideally be allies, right? They're supposed to work together. That's why Fakoli initially won't join Sunjata's army. Right, it's like, no, this, this particular kinship tie is too important, is too strong. I have to fight with my uncle rather than with you. But Sumawaro then goes and violates that kinship tie by taking away Fakoli's wife. So Sumawaro is Fakoli's uncle? Mm-hmm. Yes. And this sort of fits a larger pattern of behavior with Sumawaro as well, right? What did we note about Sunjata and about Sunjata's general behavior with others last time? Yeah, Sunjata is generous, right? Sunjata gives to his followers and to his enemies. What about Sumawaro? Yeah, Sumawaro doesn't give, he takes. He takes away Fakoli's wife. What else does he take? He takes land. I'm sorry, what was, the, what was, what was it you said? Lives. lives. <laughs> Lots of lives. He kills an awful lot of people. Like, it's kind of amazing at the end of his little reign of terror that there are any people left in the Mandan, right? Given the number of times he keeps summoning them to, the, to, to these places and killing them. That also brings up the question. When he summons them, why do they come? He's just going to, it's been proven time and time again. He's just uh -huh. going to kill them all when they get there. And mm -hmm. only a few that have like really powerful magic that makes them like, poof, goes well, if the people, people, how would people know the others were dead if all of them were dead that were killed beforehand? They didn't come well, back. They, come <laughs> they went there and they found them with dead? piles of bodies. <laughs> oh my God. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I, I think what, what a lot of that is meant to demonstrate is how beaten down the Mandan is under Sumawaro, right? Sumawaro is a dictator. Um, Sumawaro is cruel. You have to just do what Sumawaro says. Um, Sumawaro also has a great deal of Dalilu, right? Of this sort of, you know, inner reserves of occult power. Right, so odds are, even if he didn't show up, he'd find you. Yeah, secret. I got confused on what started his wrath against mm -hmm. Dante. Mm -hmm. I knew something with the tattoos or something. Yeah, and, and, and this, this portion of the epic, um, or this uh, version of the epic omits that little uh, episode, but yeah. Um, what happens is that uh, Sumawaro, in, in most versions of the story, Sumawaro has this um, sort of sacred hammock that only he is permitted to sit in. And so if anyone else were to sit in that hammock, that's a, a violation of the taboo. Um, you find in a lot of, a lot of myth, um, there are characters who can only maintain their power by obeying certain restrictions on their behavior or forcing certain restrictions on others, right? So this is an example of that, right? One of the things that helps Sumawaro maintain his power is keeping this sacred tab where no one else is allowed to sit 
in this particular hammock. Now, some of that I think is like sort of just the power of intimidation, right? If you sit in my hammock, so help you. But yeah, Sunjata goes and deliberately sits in Sumawaro's hammock. Now, this is in part because Sumawaro is someone who has moved above his station. Sumawaro, and this doesn't really come out in this version of the epic, but it's prominent in other versions, is a smith. So he's a member of that artisan class, like the jelly, right? These specialized professionals who are supposed to be excluded from actually ruling. Right? A smith or a jelly, they're not supposed to be kings. And a smith is a blacksmith? Yeah. Yeah, Sumo, yeah, Sumo Waro is a blacksmith. Yeah, Confucius, right, where everybody's supposed to have their place in the hierarchy and not really step out of that place. And if they did, then it was, um... Bring them down. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then they had to be brought back into balance. So is that mm -hmm. kind of what's going on with this one, where Sinjata has to bring him back into balance with the war and everything? Yeah, I, I think there. Yeah, I think there is a similar idea at work here, right? I don't think there's any direct influence uh, of Confucius or Confucian ideas on this particular epic. But yeah, I think there is that same idea that Sumawaro is someone who has overstepped his bounds, and that has sort of caused chaos. Yeah, Ty. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. If we yeah, let's uh, can take, if we look at it's 1551, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Sumawaro took out his lute, came and sat down by people who were conversing. Masogalonkande was content. Sunjata and the others came and sat down. Masogalonkande said, "Wait, I will sing three songs." They said, "Very well." When anybody sang, Sumawaro would accompany them on the lute. For Masogolon Kande's first song, she sang, Big Ram, the pen where the rams are kept, the leopard must not enter. Big Ram, the pen where the rams are kept, the leopard must not enter. Sumawuro's lute was in harmony with her song. After that, what else did she sing? She sang, Pit Water. Don't compare yourself with clear water flowing over rocks. The pure white rocks, pit water. Don't compare yourself with clear water flowing over rocks. The pure white rocks. Sumawuro's lute was in harmony with her song. The third song she sang was Big Vicious Dog. If you kill your vicious dog, someone else's will bite you. Vicious Dog. If you kill your vicious dog, somebody else's will bite you. Sumawaro's lute was in harmony with her song. So each time, Sumawaro's lute is in harmony with the song, but at the same time, the song is delivering uh, a sort of prophecy uh, to or criticism of Sumawaro. Right? Yeah, don't let the leopard in the pen or he's going to eat all of the rams, right? Here's the leopard right over here. I brought him with me. <laughs> right? This is your doom you're looking at. Pit water. What's that? Pit water. Yeah, Fil right. filthy water, right? Don't compare yourself with the clean water, right? And of course, a blacksmith in his work dirties a lot of water. And <clears throat> the bit about the big, the big vicious dog, right? Sumawaro is going to sweep into the Mandan, another part of this that's omitted, um, and, you know, kill Dankaran Tuman, Sunjata's usurping half-brother, and take over the, the Mandan for himself. So Essentially, he, each one of these songs is a separate warning to him about what may come in the future. Absolutely, yeah, that's what's going on. Yeah, each of these songs is a little warning to Sumawaro. Now, this may seem a little bit impolite, because after all, Sumawaro has just taken them in. <laughs> but, nonetheless. But at the same time, it's a warning about the future, so I don't know if he's a little rude other than the fact that he didn't take them. Yeah. A, th 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 thank you for taking us in. We're gonna kill you. <laughs> you, have let, you have let your doom in by the front door. Uh, yeah, secret. Um, to, um, 
I was confused with mm -hmm. the death of the king when he uh, so just say asked to bury his mother yeah. for the land. I was confused on what made the king change his mind. I know he was talking to the people. Uh huh. And then, <laughs> okay, so, so you're, you're talking about like in the, the kingdom of Nema, right? Where um, Sobolon Conde dies, Sunjata wants to bury her, and then what does he want to do after he's buried his mother? Yeah, he wants to leave. And how have things been going for the king of Nema while Sunjata and his brother have been fighting in his army? Yeah. Hey, this guy's really good for us, right? We don't want these two to leave. If I let them bury their mother here and go, right, then I don't get the benefit any longer of their service. All right, let's look on page 1558. Don't we also take the men they captured with them? Yeah, he, Sunjata has actually built an army out of, he gets a certain percentage of the captives that he takes. Uh, most West African warfare at this time was not um, deadly combat. The idea was to capture people. Um, it's actually not unlike um, the way aristocrats fought each other uh, in Europe the in the Aztecs Middle Ages, right? What's that? Or the Aztecs fought each other? Or the way the Aztecs, well, yeah, the Aztecs were looking for victims for sacrifice, typically. But yeah, they were, they were, yeah, they went to war to capture. Yeah, Savannah. Uh, this is probably going to sound really weird, but you know the Prince of Persia, maybe, where he has, like, all these, like, thieves and stuff uh -huh. and him around? Where it's, they, in, where it's in Iran, but everybody has English accents? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but they use the thieves to actually break down the wall. So it's yeah. like kind of the same thing with them taking captives. Like the same sort of idea, or is it different? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, I haven't actually seen, I've, I've only seen the trailer for that particular movie, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I think what he's doing, it's also not unlike the way uh, pirate crews would take a ship, and then they'd offer the crew <coughs> a chance to either, you know, okay, you can turn pirate with us, or we're just going to leave you floating in a little boat. Um, so yeah, but it, it's he, he is building up an army out of captives that he's taken from other places that he can then use to come and retake the man. So he does now have a little crew of soldiers that are personally loyal to him and not to the king of Nema. So he's becoming dangerous, but he's also a really, really good war leader. So this guy doesn't want to lose him. Right, because from the time Sunjata arrived up to that day, he did not engage in any battle that was lost by the people of Kuntunya. Every campaign he went on, he returned with slaves. But he could not detain Sunjata because he came by his own choice. He wanted to start a quarrel so he could detain Sunjata. So he refuses, after the first two requests, to grant the land to bury Sobolon Conde until Sunjata sends him the symbolic message, right? He picked up a fragment of an old clay pot, he picked up a piece of old calabash, he picked up the feather of a guinea fowl, he picked up a partridge feather. He added a stick of bamboo to these. He put the things together, gave them to Mandan Bori and said, tell him he's, that I say he should give me land to bury my mother in. If he needs a price for his land, this is his land price. Let him agree for me to lay my mother in the ground. When Farhan Tunkara was given these things, Mandan Bori said, My brother says this is your land price, that you should agree to give him land. Farhan Tunkara said, Is this what you pay for land in your country, huh, Mandan Bori? I do not ever want to see you here again. Take these things and go away. But then how does the king learn to interpret this symbol? The jelly. Yes. One of the things this story is meant to do is to... Um, illustrate the cultural importance of the jelly, not just as a musician or storyteller, but also as a valued advisor to the king. Right? The jelly understands the symbolic importance of the message. The king doesn't get it. His jelly man was sitting there beside him. He said, he should not take those things away from here. Heh, this is an important message that has been sent to you. The jelly said, Mba, when these people came, 
Did I not tell you that you should kill him? Did you not say that he had come to, the, to place himself in your care and you must not do anything to him? Aha, he has said something to you. There is a message in these things that were sent. If you do not understand it, I will tell you the meaning. Faran Tunkara said, all right, tell me the meaning. The jelly said, this piece of bamboo means that you should give him land so he can bury his mother in it. If you do not give him land, the Mande people will come and take it. If they came and called him for the kingship, after he finishes fighting that war for Manden, he will take the army of Manden, he will bring it here to Nema, he will break Nema like an old clay pot, he will break Nema like a calabash. This is the old calabash. The guinea fowls and partridges will take dust bats in the ruins of Nema. These are the feathers of the guinea fowls and partridges. You will not see anything growing here but weeds. This piece of bamboo stick is from the ruins. And it's after this interpretation of the message that the king changes his tune, right? It's like, well, give me your mother's potty as a gift, right? Let me do the burial, and then I'm gonna let you go. So yeah, what changes the king's tune is the threat. Because he knows this guy can deliver on it. Right, one thing that we've seen throughout this, right, is that Sunjata is depicted as this kind of child of destiny, right, who learns to walk despite the evil spells that are cast on him through sheer force of will, right, who comes to be born even largely through sheer doggedness and force of will, um, and who spends his time in exile building up his independent power base so that he can go back and take his homeland back from the usurper. Now, to get back to this usurper, right, what else do we notice that's unusual about Sumawara? I'm sorry, uh, what was that? His clothes, yeah. What does he wear? What does, he, what does this guy like to walk around in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we talked about him taking land, we talked about him taking wives, and taking lives. He also takes, takes people's skin and makes it into clothes. Right, if you look on page 1571, Mandan had mourned after every battle against Sumuoro, he made all the women widows. He sewed shirts of human skin with the skins of Mande and Soso -so people. He sewed trousers of human skin with the skins of Mande and Soso -so people. He sewed a hat of human skin. After that, he sewed shoes of human skin. He summoned the Mande people to come and give his shoes a name. So the idea of sewing clothes out of human skin, right? What this is meant to demonstrate is Sumawaro's barbarism. Right? Sumawaro is an uncivilized person who is not only inhospitable, is not only ungenerous, but also partici uh, participates in old traditions that need to be suppressed, that need to die, that should have been supplanted long ago by newer, more civilized traditions. Right? The idea that the king is entitled to the very skin of his subjects is an idea the epic t the, that most versions of the epic argue needs to die. Now, <clears throat> This, is, this remains important when Sunjata and Sumawaro meet in combat on page 1575. Sunjata said, Sumawaro, what is the matter? He replied, Sunjata, kill me here. Do not carry me to the town. Do not bring such shame to me. So let's just stop here for a second. Does this sound familiar at all? Don't kill me here. Don't carry me to the town. Have we seen this before? Buffalo. The buffalo woman, yeah. So let's just set that aside for a moment. Because this is a sort of uh, side point. Sumawaro said, God controls all time, do not take me back. 
Sumawaro removed his Dalilu, he released his horsewhip, he dropped everything and took off his human skin shirt. He stripped his body. Sunjata said, I am not going to finish you off. From where you are, nobody can climb out. He said, I do not want your shirt of human skin. Because it is the skin of my father's relatives, I do not want it. Sunjata would not take it. So what does Sunjata's rejection of Sumawaro's shirt indicate about him? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's, he's not going to continue Sumawaro's barbaric practices. Right? I don't want to wear your human skin shirt. That's just, for one thing, it's nasty, right? It's kind of ironic that he would say God controls all the time, mm -hmm. considering um, we usually associate religion and stuff like that with not being barbaric, but he's pretty barbaric. And yeah, that, that, that is a weird kind of thing here, the, uh, that Sumawaro is almost always, in all versions of the epic, the voice of older pagan values. And Sunjata is almost always the voice of more contemporary Islamic values. Okay, um, five pillars of Islam, one of them is about confession. Yeah. Would this be a version, of, <coughs> would this be like him confessing in a way? Like, because we said that mm -hmm. it has to do with Islam, so could this be his way of, because he took off his barbaric stuff and everything. Yeah, you know. It's like, you know, kill me, mm -hmm. but before you kill me, you know, God controls all the time. Yeah, you know, I, I I never I never actually really thought of that, but um, yeah, I that that it, that is actually an interesting reading of this. Um, yeah, he takes off all of his pagan accoutrements, and then says God controls all time. Yeah, that sort of admission um, of the Islamic idea of sort of the infinite power of of a single God. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I actually yeah I. I I actually, I kind of like that reading. Actually, that's that works for me. <laughs> you know, I I had always just kind of thought of that as a kind of like weird little aside, um, but yeah, yeah, no, that actually makes a lot of sense. So, <clears throat> one thing that we did note last time as well is that in most versions of the epic, Sumawaro is permitted to survive. Right, Sumawaro goes off into the hills and disappears um, and is never heard from again, but he isn't killed. Um, this is because the performer, the storyteller, does not want to insult or humiliate anyone in the audience who regards themselves as descended from Sumawaro. Right, because he is still a powerful ancestor spirit. Um, he is the ancestor of the Soso family. You remember uh, last time I showed you that little performance uh, by uh, a guy called, who called himself Papa Suso? Well, does Suso sound like anything? So so, so, so yeah, exactly. It's, just, it's another version of the same name, yeah. So this is still a fairly, Soso and Suso are still fairly common family names in Mali and Guinea. So you don't want to piss off anybody's ancestors, right? You don't want to offend anybody's ancestors. So you tone down the end of the epic, typically. Um, but how does this particular bard deal with this? Yeah, Ty. Certainly, yeah, it's certainly more okay for Fakoli, who is a close relative of Sumawaro, to kill him than it is for Sunjata, right? And we see as well here, it's like, okay, maybe this is part of why they set up that situation where Sumawaro violates the kinship relationship through taking Fakoli's wife away, right? So Fakoli is then justified in killing his uncle, even though they have this close Videnya relationship. Yes, yeah, Savannah. Um, you said that they don't want to offend like either side, but mm -hmm. it's obvious, like in the epic, that Sinjata is supposed to be, you know, the good side, and Sinjata, yeah, uh, Sinmawaro is supposed to be the bad side. This is—I don't want to say it's the first time we've seen this, but mm -hmm. I feel like it's the first time that's been this prevalent. 
that you have a good and evil. Uh, other times, right. like, you can still somewhat see like the evil sides, you know, mm-hmm. point of view on things. Um, yeah. So how would that not be offensive? Like, well, it's, you know, like, and, and I, your ancestor barbarians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, for for and you know, the, the, and that that is that is actually a really good question, um, and I think. I'm gonna you know sort of, I'm gonna answer this as best I can. I think it, the idea of sort of humiliation here has more to do with depicting the ancestor in defeat. Um, it's not so much about Sumawaro's moral qualities as it is about you know it's humiliating to hear about your family being beaten at something um, and being completely and thoroughly beaten. Right, so if Sumawara was killed by Sunjata, that's more humiliating than if he is simply allowed to go free. So, like, they don't care how he lives his life, they just care, like, how he dies, basically. Like, if somebody, if their enemy kills him, mm-hmm. it means more than, like, like him living horribly and yeah. it, other family well, lives and stuff. It, 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 also, it also creates potential for a clan conflict, right? And one thing that we do have to remember too is that essentially this epic is intended to glorify one particular family, one particular clan, right? The whole purpose of the Sunjata epic is to proclaim the glory of the Kaita line and to a lesser extent some of its allied lines, right? So they want to proclaim the glory of the Kaita but they want to do it without necessarily humiliating or offending the Soso or the Tarawari or these various other families whose stories get wrapped up in this. Um, so they still play subsidiary roles. You know, the Tarawari, for example, are the descendants of the two Sharifu brothers who killed the buffalo woman. Now there is a great deal of political rivalry and contemporary Mali between uh, some of these families. Uh, for example, the first president of independent Mali, I think I might have mentioned this last time, was a Kaita. And he was then assassinated and usurped by a Tarawari. So these family conflicts are still, are still very much alive. Uh, and I think particularly today, a lot of uh, a lot of jelly try to do what they can to avoid inflaming them. I don't understand it because mm-hmm. um, it's like your ancestors, what they do in their life is kind of what defines you. Like mm-hmm. nobody wants to be related to Hitler because of what he did sure. during his life. It didn't yeah. matter how he died; it just mattered. Like, yeah, and it's just mm-hmm. like it's kind of the same thing here. Like mm-hmm. why why was this not offensive? They don't want to sure. offend the ancestors, but why wasn't this offensive? It's something he did uh-huh. during his life that yeah. basically does, it basically just shapes the mm-hmm. rest of his clan and the rest of his, you know, mm-hmm. history. I just, yeah. I just don't and, see how it's not offensive. And I, I, I guess um, what it comes down to ultimately is an idea of social prestige, um, not wanting to take away what social prestige they have. Uh, that's kind of the best answer I can come up with. I, I agree. This is a weird conundrum, um, and you know, I, I, I do not think that uh, most you know people in contemporary Mali would um, would be okay with someone you know murdering lots of people and wearing their skin. Um, you know, most people anywhere would not be okay with that. Um, but in cultures where um, your social prestige determines your social position. People are very, very sensitive about loss of face. And loss of face comes from things like defeats. Yeah, Ty. Um, it was just a question I had for the story. Um, uh-huh. When they go, every time some more water was talking to whatever he was talking to, and it was like, uh, I guess it's just back on up, and mature and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I didn't really understand what they meant by that. Okay. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he's he's talking to an he's talking to an oracle, right? Do you know? Uh, do you, does everybody know what an oracle is? No. Future seer. 
Yeah, usually, uh, usually some some kind of a seer, problem, right? Prophecy. Yeah, a prophet, right? So the, yeah, this oracle um, is someone who is able to do divinations for him, to tell him about the state of his enemy. Right, your your enemy has grown and is coming for you. Right, he's like I can, you know, take out the Ouija board or throw the bones or roll the, you know, you know, talk to the spirits or whatever, and. Um, determine where Sanjata is and whether he's coming for you or not. So that's, yeah, he's consulting some kind of diviner, some kind of seer. Yeah, secret. But, um, but this is going farther back. When him and his brother was out hunting, and mm -hmm. then when they came in, the sister took the internal gut yeah. from them, they should put some kind of curse, I think, on the brother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think okay, we're right. Yeah, um, I and it, I think it would help if we uh, just think back for a minute. You know, again, to the beginning of the course, we talked a little bit about theories of myth, right? So there were two theories of myth that might help us understand some of what's going on here. Right. The first. Right, the Romanian philosopher Mircea Eliada, who argues that myth always describes an act of creation. Right, myth always describes the moments of something coming into being, whether it's a social practice, or a kingdom, or the whole universe, or some species, or some natural phenomena, whatever, right? For Eliada, myth always describes the beginning of something. And we've seen a lot of that in here, right? Like, you know, this is the origin of this particular social practice. Um, this is, you know, the origin of, you know, the Kaita rule over the Mandan, right? But, <clears throat> What that, from Eliada's point of view, what that little story would be describing is the exclusion of Mandan Bori's descendants from ruling the Mandan, right? The line is counted from Sujata, not from Mandan Bori. And this is why. This is how Mandan Bori's line fell out of favor. Right? Because he insulted his sister and she put a curse on him. Now, <clears throat> there's another view of myth that is sort of, I guess, more congenial to my own turn of mind a little bit. Um, the French anthropologist and literary critic René Girard argues that myth, in fact, justifies institutions that already exist. So if we think back again to those, uh, those, you know, those wacky self-castrating priests um, who would you know, drop all those magic mushrooms on that particular holiday, right? the myth, the story attached to that right, of you know, their goddess uh, appearing in her full glory and freaking out the founder of their priesthood, uh, <clears throat> that would be, that story, that myth would be a justification of something that people were already doing for some other reason that they'd probably forgotten. So whatever the practice is, whatever the institution is, whatever the nation is, what have you, it's something that already exists that somebody then makes up a story to explain. So I think particularly in this case, Girard's view is more accurate, given that we've got <laughs> stories that are orally transmitted that change over generations. So Mandan Bori's little, um, uh, what do we want to call it, little misdeed here, right, is here, you know, from Girard's point of view, this is a story that's been made up to explain the exclusion of this particular family, this particular line of Kaita descendants from leadership. 
right? Because Mandan Bori insulted his sister, well, we don't know if Mandan Bori insulted his sister, right? We have no idea if this actually happened. We made up the story to explain why this line never ruled. Yes, you know. So, um, Gerard's version is more like, like Dillian and the Odyssey. Like we have history mm -hmm. of Troy and everything, but they kind of describe like why that happened. Is that sort of what Yes. It's... Well, I, I think that I think that Gerard's reading of myth and history and their relationship is more accurate than Eliade's is uh, sort of to begin with. Um, with Eliade, really, like the myth almost comes first or comes into being simultaneously with the practice, right? With the institution. Um, we do tend to read backwards onto history, right? We tend to read ideology onto history. Uh, you know, why is it so many people, for example, want to turn back the clock to 1957, right? They don't actually remember 1957. And the world wasn't really all that great in 1957 either, right? Certain classes of people in the United States were more prosperous than they are now, but the idea they have of that past is largely sort of a false one coded in the rosy glow of nostalgia. Now, they want, now, Girard is speaking to that sort of human need to explain why things are the way they are, <coughs> why we do certain things that we do, right? Why is it that once every year, a group of us drops magic mushrooms and castrates themselves, right? We don't want that to be for no reason. There needs to be some explanation. And so we make up explanations to describe things that we're already doing. Yeah, Stephanie. So like, you said there was different versions of like this one story. So yeah. would which Jilly tells it depend on which way that goes, like whether it goes with Renee or whether it goes with Iliad? No, I, I, would, I would say that, I, I would argue that Gerard's theory of myth creation is probably overall more accurate. Um, but yeah, um, you will notice most of the differences between different Jellies versions are going to be relatively small. Um, we talked last time about you know that sort of basic spine that the epic has, right? There are certain episodes that every version contains, and variations from them tend to be fairly small and are often sort of dependent on uh, which clan of bards the speaker comes from and who their particular allies are, right? So, you know, the Diabate, for example, who are closely aligned to the Kaita, are going to play up the role of the Kaita. Bards who are allied to the Tarawari or to the Soso might, you know, tone down some of Sumawaro's atrocities. Um, bards that are related to the Tarawari might, oh, might emphasize the Sharifu brothers a bit more because those are their ancestors, right? Um, so yeah, it's not so yeah, it's not so much that they're coming from different theories. Uh, most of the jelly probably are not really all that aware of these particular theories of myth. They don't need to be, right? It's not. It's part of my job to know these theories. It's not part of their job. Right. You know? so are there like, I guess, clans like the Soso? Do they mm -hmm. have their own stories like Sinjata does, like playing up their families? Or oh sure, yeah, yeah. Um, each. Um, this is just one example, probably the most famous example of traditional West African epic. Um, but yeah, there are dozens of others. Um, and it's really pretty fascinating like how these stories have been preserved just in oral forms. You know, they don't write that they don't write them down. It's all you know, on the one hand because the stories are sacred, and two, because it's a kind of point of pride amongst these bards that, you know, I know all of this shit, right? I remember, I can remember all of this and recite it if you need me to. So yeah, that's, um, you know, um, when writing was first invented, um, there were philosophers who were, ter who were terrified that writing was going to destroy memory. And in a sense, it in a sense it did, right? People don't go around memorizing the Canterbury Tales or 
Walt Whitman's poems, that, you know, that sort of thing, right? But we have this, these tribes of bards who have all of this historical and mythological knowledge stored in their heads that they can just spit out on command. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know, but I think, I think that's pretty fucking incredible. I don't or think or just, uh, Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think it works like that kind of spiritual possession thing like the Greek poets yeah. talk about. Yeah, but um uh, yeah, I, I, I can't be one hundred percent sure about that. I don't um, I don't know enough to tell you. Alright, so let me give you some reading questions for next time. We're gonna be looking at a short excerpt from uh, Avilia Chalabi's uh, Book of Travels. So this is probably the most famous example of the literature of the Ottoman Empire. And we'll see you on Wednesday. Don't forget to turn in your in-class writings as you go.